Welcome to The Black Table, an hour devoted to exploring ideas, subjects, people of special importance to African people worldwide and to others fighting to build a better society. Um, today, we are joined by another long distance runner, a founding parent of the field of black studies, a warrior, intellectual, activist, institution builder. This is one of the most important thinkers that we've produced in over the last century. DC native, spent many years in Chicago, 
And for the last 50 years, and he'll correct me if, if we're wrong here, for the last 50 years, he has been at, at the University of Massachusetts in the Department of Afro-American Studies, where he has served as chairman two terms over the ARC and uh, built the second PhD program in the field of Black Studies. We are wel uh, we're welcoming today to the Black Table none other than John H. Bracey, Jr. Uh, Welcome, Professor Bracey. How are you? No, no, I'm good. Like I tell people, I wake up and I open my eyes, I look around, I'm still here, so I go to work. <laughs> and that is true, <laughs> brother. That is true. We we uh we only have a little less than an hour today, so we want to get right to the point. First of all, thank you for joining us. Um, when we put together the Black Table, you are one of the names that immediately came not only to mind, but it was a command. We have to get John Bracey at the table to discuss. Um, can we start at the beginning? Uh, you're a DC man. Huh? You, were, you were a DC kid raised in DC in the shadow of the campus of Howard University. It, was it four generations of educators in your family? I know your mom, Helen Harris Bracey, was on the faculty in the School of Education. Could you tell us a little bit about growing up in DC? Because I, I still find it hard to believe it. Sterling Brown helped correct your writing, and you knew Dorothy Porter, Wesley. Talk, can you talk to us about what it was like to grow up in D.C.? I guess this would have been the 40s and 50s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, was, I was actually born in Chicago, but my father worked oh. as a waiter on the Pennsylvania Railroad. So my mom's one of the steady jobs, so she got a job at Howard. Uh, she met my dad at Bethune Cookman, but she, my mom went to high school, went, went to college when she was 15. Graduated when she was 19, had a Rosenwald, and then had a Jeans Foundation fellowship. And she went down to Bethune Cookman to meet Miss Bethune, talk to Miss Bethune. And Miss Bethune gave her a letter, you know, it's in Bethune papers go over to the dean of students, I want him to hire you. And that's what the recruitment process was. This is Miss, the bearer of this letter is Mrs. Helen Constant Harris. Please hire her. Right? Well, she met my dad at Bethune Cookman. He's only like one year older than her because she graduated from college at 19. Mm. And she's teaching when she's 19, you know. Uh, taught at Tougaloo when she's 13, she and, my, she and my aunt. They taught in the Daniel Hand schools. She, my, I got 10 Tougaloo alums in my family. Tougaloo, so, so, when, so when August Meyer, who we'll talk about a little bit later, ends up at Tougaloo, he's actually following in your footsteps, not the other way around. No, 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 he knows the, the people that, that he taught at Tougaloo were friends of my mom's. Wow. So when I did a book with Augie, they started laughing because they said Augie was crazy even then. They said Augie would go around reading and bumping into the light posts and apologizing to the light posts and all this stuff. I mean, Augie was a ship. Right? <laughs> so when I first met him, he knew all of the same people I knew. And but my mom's my mom's wanted to steady job, especially doing like I was born in World War One, you know, three, three months before World, you know, Pearl Harbor, right? So there weren't a lot of jobs. So she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay fixed. And so she uh, did Tuskegee, and then she went back to, to Howard. And, and so I grew up on the campus of Howard University, right? My dad was gone because he's on the railroad, right? So, you know, it was like a female-headed household. Mm -hmm. My sister went to college when she was 15, right? She skipped grades like it didn't even matter. She, you know, she went to Dunbar High School, which I wanted to go to. I wanted to go to Dunbar. I'm still pissed about that. Integration oh, sure you are. did not let me go to Dunbar. Why not? Right? You, 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 you had to go to neighborhood schools, man. This is after Brown. But you, so you, but, I know you went to Banneker Junior High School. Yeah, yeah, but Banneker, Banneker was a junior high, and I was ready to go to Dunbar. Yeah. But then they integrated the schools in D.C., so you oh, had to go to a school in your neighborhood. Oh, so I had a man. choice. I could go to Cadoza with all the gangbangers. Like all my thug friends, I said, I ain't going, no, no, I already know y'all. Like, I ain't, I ain't fooling with y'all. You know, the Jolly Stompers, the Joy Park, all them. But I said, no, no. So you had a choice of Roosevelt or Coolidge. So all my partners up on the hill, second alphabet in D.C., you know, second alphabet, went to Roosevelt. So here I am, integrated, hated it. I hated three years. I didn't learn anything three years in Roosevelt. The teachers hated us. The principal hated us. The principal was testifying that integration wasn't working. They were always asking you to join or join the army. I mean, it was like war. I was at war for three years in high school. Bob, like, I don't, I don't want us to leave this for a second, yeah. just for a second, just to sit in this for a minute, because so far you've, you've talked about black institutions producing this incredible standard 
that you were born into, but then you become a shock troop in integration. You literally live that intersection, huh? But that's 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 what the, the irony was. The irony was that what we wanted, if you look at the early black studies, what Mike and all and I wanted was to have Howard University in microcosm. Yes, sir. Right? Because I knew I knew more than the white folks did because I had to know their stuff because I did. I mean, I can quote me some Shakespeare. You know, you have done the state some service and I know it. You know, all that kind of stuff. I can do I can do it. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, went to the sessions of Sweet Silent, thought I'd sum up remembers of things. I can do some Shakespeare, right? But you can't do Langston Hughes. No, sir. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. No, sir. Right, or no Dunbar. No, no, an no, no, you knew. Slave. You knew Sterling right. Brown as a Still kid. Out. And that's right. And that's that's how you signify it on somebody. When you come at me, don't come by ones and twos. You better come by tens. No question. And that's Sterling Brown. No, no. If you have done by high school, you're saturated with poetry and culture. Right? You're saturated with it. I studied violin for 12 years. I played first violin, studied with Louia Jones. Right, whoa, who whoa, Du Bois whoa. said was the greatest black violinist of the 20th century. That's right. That's right. I, that's what free, free. He knew my mom's. I didn't pay a penny because we didn't have any money. Right. So whatever, whenever I went to, to to violin lessons, he put me in whatever class was happening. So it might be an ensemble, it might be a full orchestra, it might be two people. He said, play with them. So I got the best free music education you could get, and you had to take tests on music theory. My right? yeah, and, and not on, not only that type of education uh, in the cultural grounding. You you've written extensively, and, and by the way, you all over two dozen books, either edited or uh, introduced or single author, yeah. not yeah. counting all the other publications. But you've written about music. Could you tell us a little bit about what it was like to leave your house and walk to the Howard Theater or Bohemian Cameras and the Dunbar Lounge? Maybe oh, I live, I live, I, oh man, you talk about you know, like and first of all. You know, the Howard Theater was the bomb, right? You know, and the, the you went to, the, you know, doo-wop. I grew up on doo-wop. Bebop first. I love bebop, mm -hmm. right? So you went to all them clubs. I never told my moms because you weren't supposed to go to them kind of places, right? So I said, yeah, I'm going out. And I said, blah, 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 blah. And they'd be going to one of them cafes where the dudes be cutting you and all that stuff. And they, you know, drinking, drinking slow gin in the in the in the bathrooms and all, because nobody wanted to pay the cover charge and all that business. But it's the best music in the world, man. Yes, sir. You know, yes, sir. And I loved, uh, you know, I'd go to New York on the bus and go to Birdland and hear Miles when Miles had Coltrane in the group. Huh? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. I'm like, I'm like 19 years old. I spent. Come on, I, man. I'm about to say you must have been a kid. So you saw Train before he got strung out and Miles put him out the band. Look, we 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 were bit, when I, I I worked in a camp on in on Staten Island as a third cook. I basically washed pots, but I didn't like the title pot washer, so I said, "Can I call myself third cook?" The cook said, "You call yourself King of England, long as the pots get clean." So I, <laughs> but what what my little buddy did was he took me to every place in New York because he liked jazz too. So we went to the Five Spot, the Blue Note, all these places, man, Bird Land, and so I'm sitting in the peanut gallery because I'm too young to drink. Right. Right. So I ain't had to buy no liquor. They charge you the same amount for a Coke. But I'm sitting there. It's Miles Davis Quintet with Coltrane, Cannonball, Adelaide, Winton Kelly. And we hollering in because they were cutting Coltrane off, man. They, we love Coltrane oh, from the man. beginning when he's playing tenor. Boy, he got to see yeah. right. Giant Steps. All, oh. all that stuff with Miles, man. Green Dolphin Street. Right. And and Cold Chain be like blowing, man, and Miles and, and Adley would close up in front of him and cut him off, man. We said, let him play, man, let him play. <laughs> and so finally Cold Chain got out of there. Yeah. And he left him. Right. Yeah. And so I saw him every time I could, every time he came to Chicago or anywhere, I'd go see John Cold Well, we're gonna we're gonna pause in about 60 seconds, but before we do, let's see, can we squeeze this in? You decided that you were going to Howard, but you didn't stay. What happened? No, no, I went, I went, I went for one year. You, right. never, you, you never go to a school where your, your mother teaches. <laughs> everybody remembers you from when you were five years old. No question. Right. And so they still look at me like I'm five years old, even though I'm in college, right? Of course. And my sister's boyfriend was the TA for the for the biology class. 
So she sent me a grading papers in my living room asking me, what grade do I want? Well, this is not education, right? Come it's on. It's not education. It's not education. I, I would have been, but the thing that really got me was Frazier. Frazier wrote Black Bourgeoisie. And for those, for those here at the table who don't know that name, that, of course, is the great Edward Franklin Frazier, the yeah, great Frank Frank, yeah. Yes, yes. Frazier, Frazier wrote Black Bourgeoisie in French. That's right. And left, it, and left it in the library for two years. And and people would come by and say, oh, I read your book. And Frazier would say, that Negro can't read a word of French. He's lying, right? <laughs> and, but Frazier would sit in my mom. People would hide in my mom's office, you know, right next on the elevator in Douglas Hall, second, second floor. Second floor Douglas Hall, yes, sir. That's right. Yes. And that little tiny little office, I'd be in there and looking out the window doing my homework. And Frazier would come back and sit next to me, and I'd be listening to all of you know, be, be William Banner and and, and Mayfield Logan, and uh, Robert Martin, Sterling Brown, and all of them. And he would say, uh, "What do you think they're talking about?" I said, I, "I don't quite get all of it." He said, "Don't worry about it; they don't get it either." <laughs> and he crack up laughing. And well, he says, "He says, son, you got to learn the difference between a PhD and a Negro PhD." I say, you say white people would give anybody any Negro a PhD because they know they ain't gonna teach their kids. They're going back to a black school and they don't care whether you know a thing or not. They don't care. Right? So there are a lot of people walking around. They call themselves doctor. Yes, sir. Right? But ain't nothing going on up there because white people didn't teach them anything and they didn't care if they didn't learn anything. Bob, I'm afraid sometimes it's worse now than it may have been when you were coming along. But I yeah, tell you yeah. what. We, we're going to yeah. pick up with that on the other side of the break. We're going to pause yeah. for a moment. Uh, and when we come back, we are going to pick up with Professor John Bracey, who's just given us a very quick but profound glimpse into his early uh, life and beginning. And when we come back, we're going to go to the city of Chicago at Roosevelt University. Back in a moment at the Black Table. They put 10 in here. 10, and you don't come out till you die. And you eat him, you hoop 10. Oh you my manage God. to the Black Table. I'm Greg Carr here on the Black Star Network with Professor John Bracey, and we're honored to have him. Prof, when we left, uh, you had gotten some sterling uh, insight from the great E. Franklin Frazier. Uh, I think he was the first Black president of the American Sociological uh, um, yeah. Association. Wasn't he? And then, uh, so you decide to hit, go west, young man. You end up in the Midwest, in the city of Big Shoulders, at a, at a very radical idea of a university, Roosevelt University, which, uh, if I'm not mistaken, may be younger than you are, a very young university at the time. Tell us about going to Roosevelt, man. What was that like? What kind of place was Roosevelt University? Well, when after one year at Howard, I quit and took the civil service exam and got a job working in the mail room out in Arlington Hall Station near the Pentagon. Mm. That's when I knew how messed up the government and the military was, because I delivered mail, right? I had a top secret clearance, man. My most important work, yeah, I couldn't get it by, you know, after I left, but my most important work was making sure that the Joint Chiefs of Staffs got in their bets on the World Series or a football game, right? So I'm running around with a, with a red cover over a football pool 
and the work you could do in like about three hours. And the first day I was in the mail room, I, I got a ride. You, know, you had a little car, I took it over from Arlington Hall over to the Pentagon. You go to the Pentagon, you give the guys the mail, pick up the mail bag, and you come back. I came back about 2 o'clock, and they said, why are you back? I said, well, I took the mail over, got the mail back. They said, don't ever come back here before 5 o'clock. He said, if they find out that we can do this in three hours, they'll fire half of us. So I said, what am I supposed to do? They say, do whatever you want. Go to the movies. Take three lunches. So I, what I did was I could order anything related to my job because I was in the mailroom. I, so I started reading the U.S. Army field manuals on African countries. They did a report on the, the, the military situation in every African country. What was this, 1959, 60? 59, 59, 60. And so they're getting ready for African Union. This is That's right, right. Like the year of Africa is 1960. And, and as, as folks, right. some of you all I'm may not know, some of you know. Right they're getting school. ready for they're getting ready for African independence and they exactly. want to know who everybody and they don't lie to each other. You know what I'm saying? They oh, may no. lie in the books you get in school, but the military, they, they ain't got time to be lying because their lives depend on them getting stuff right. Well, that's that's what a lot of people say. Say of the historians, the military historians are the best to read because all they're trying to figure out is how to beat you. So they that's got right. to be honest. That's <laughs> right. So you mean you mean you got your view of Nkrumah. They got an inside view saying he's this, this, and this, but he also, we got him on this one over here, we got him on this one over here, and this is where we can go after him, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm reading every African country I can get my hands on, right? <laughs> and this is part of my job, right? Then they taught us how to run, we had to run the, the uh, movie projectors, and the white guy brought in eight millimeter porno films, you know, dogs and monkeys, all that kind of weird stuff. Mm -hmm. Me and this other brother, we started, first we looked at the Olympics all the way down to 1956. You know, they had films. And then we got, you know, we got into Nuremberg trials, film. We, look, we looked at the army films when they, when they liberated the concentration camps. And we looked, we, looked, we looked at the liberation of Dachau and Buchenwald, those people coming out of there. Did you see and, the black soldiers? Yeah, yeah. We you sitting there saying, yeah, we're sitting there saying, these are white people doing this to other white people. That's right. You know how they feel about us. I mean, if you if you look if you look at the Jewish people coming out of Booker Wall and Dachau. Yes, sir. Right. It's like what human beings would do that to another human being. You know, and we sat there thinking, these are white people doing this to white people. Like, you know, we're down the line, you know. So so how did then how did you end up? You know, it's interesting. I was looking at a, a bit of uh, footage. And I don't know if you may have seen it, may not. You were over at the Center for Inner City Studies. I guess it's the old Abraham Lincoln building. It oh, was yeah, here, yeah. Harold Pates, uh, yeah, Nick yeah. Nelson, Anderson Thompson on a on a panel dealing with Harold Cruz. And yeah, I mean, yeah. and, you know, we know each other a long time, but I'd never seen that clip. And, and it, it is it's just reiterated for me how important you are and were in that early intellectual work. But so far, I mean, how do you end up going to Chicago to study in the first place? Given Was that was that the moment that shocked you, working at the Pentagon, seeing that and saying, No, no, my, co my cousin Billy, the one that taught me bebop. Yes, sir. Said, There's only one school in the country that will put up with you. Okay. And he said, that's the school called, it says Roosevelt. And I said, why do you think so? Because it's full of crazy people just like you. <laughs> and so I transferred to Roosevelt. And when I hit Roosevelt, you go to the cafeteria and every organization had a table. So I gravitated, I just got there, you know, like every political tendency, you know, you had the Yipsos, the Communist Party, the Trotskyists, you know, anarchists, everybody, you know, the managed school for management, everybody, and you sat at the table that had your, your thing, right? Yes, sir. So I, I had already met Sterling Stuckey in the civil rights movement, because I'd already got, you know, starting to do civil rights stuff. Uh, and I, I found a table with the black people, and I said, like, what's supposed to be happening around here? They said, first of all, you have to take Drake. And I said, what, do you, what is Drake? And Sinclair Drake was moving down the hallway real fast, big afro before you had afros, a whole stack of Xeroxes in his hand, shirt tail out, and he said, that's Drake, take whatever he teaches, My right? Dear. And from that day on, you, if, you, if you were in the class, you got a seat. But you took Drake's class every time he taught it because it was different every time. 
Right? If you weren't registered in the class, you had to sit on the floor in the windowsill, right? Because only the teams that were paying for the class got the seats, right? So I took Drake like five different times. I lived in his office. I'd follow him down the hall, and he puts you to work. You sit in the office. He say, "Here, I want you to put these folders in order for me." And I said, "Oh, what is this?" He said, "Well, these are Busia's files on Nkuma." And I said, "Why do you have them?" He said, "Well." Lucia was writing this expose of corruption in the Convention People's Party, and he thought Kwame was on to him, so he gave me the whole. And I said, wow, what am I supposed to do with this? He said, well, you got to write a paper in geography class right on the Cocoa Marketing Board. I'm writing on the Cocoa Marketing Board, but those are not seeing all them guys, right? You know, the Cocoa Farmers. Of course. As an undergraduate at Roosevelt University, That's under right. the tutelage of the great, and for those of you who don't know this name, Right, this one yeah, down to John the, Gibbs. He was, greatest, he was the great. He was the greatest teacher I ever had. I Man, I love St. Oh, right. but, but but Drake wasn't alone on that faculty, huh? There was uh, Lorenzo Dow Turner was on that faculty. I took, I heard, Turner, uh, Turner yeah. taught on Saturdays. African, really? culture, African culture and New World. He taught on Saturdays so community people could take the class. This is so important, y'all. And for those the well, church I guess, folk, church folk, people will come. He, he would give you a test at the first day of the class. He said, if you can identify the origin of these, these songs we're going to play, you get an A in the class. So he'd play like a clip out of a song, right? I mm -hmm. said, oh, we know that. That sounds like my grandmama's church. They said, no, no, no. That's Barbados. He said, oh, crap. And he said, okay, what's the next one? Then he played da 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 You say, well, okay, if that was... And that must be Alabama. He said, no, 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 that's West Africa. He said, you don't have to go to Africa to find Africa. Africa is in you. Africa it's here. In American culture, the great. It's here. The Lorenzo it's here. Man. My and, God. He, and he could break down your accent. I threw him off because I was born in Chicago, but I grew up in D.C. And he said, you don't have a Midwest accent. You got a Southern Mid-Atlantic thing in there. He could do that. And he would say, you got Mid-Atlantic and uh, I don't know that and you got any gull in your family? I'd say, yeah, my, my maternal grandparents are from South Carolina. He said, yeah, I can hear it. I yeah, can hear it in your voice. Oh, and yeah. I'd say, like, whoa. I, I mean, I loved him. I loved him. Quiet, gentle man. But he, was, he was spying on the Portuguese for African liberation movements, holding Roberto and all them. He, he was saying, look, you who went around recording tapes of people singing and dancing, why don't you keep track of how they're treating them? So he went back and wrote a report on how Portuguese colonialism was hurting black people, Africans. Mm. And then he, he published that, and then he said, they wouldn't let me come back and finish up my field study, but I guess that's okay. And he just, this is calm about it. Like, no, like, he could have gotten killed doing that. Of course, of course. He was in well, danger I mean doing that. But he just like, that's his duty. He said, I'm not just there to study black people. I'm there to use my knowledge of black people to put me in a position where I can help black people. So he is risking his life going to Portuguese territories, gathering data on Portuguese imperialism. See, and then and it, 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 a radical at all. It, so that, that helps us get a little bit of insight into your own life yeah. and practice in terms of how you combine intellectual yeah. work with social transformation. I mean, you, some of your classmates, I know uh, Darlene Clark Hines, Julian yeah. Welkner, yeah. Bob yeah. Harris, who talks about that faculty, yeah. but not only them, but yeah. at that time in Chicago, if, uh, I think, uh, like you say, Sterling Stuckey, J James Turner is at Northwestern, but you're also in the community. Could you talk a little bit about your social activism in Chicago? I know you, you interacted with Malcolm X. If yeah. memory serves me correctly, you got into a little bit of a debate, and uh, you actually gave him a, a book recommendation that he took. <laughs> changed his life. Yeah. Could talk a little bit about Chicago and social activism during that period. You know, my, my whole life, I was always taught, I'll tell you where I got started. When I was, when I was a Four years old in World War II with my uh, Sanford, Florida, with my grandfather, who was a mechanic on the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, could take a part of locomotive engine. I was too young to go to school, so I hung with him. Every Sunday, he had a full-length mirror in the hallway, and he'd dress up in his white suit, straw hat, cane, and I'd have my little white suit, short pants, white <laughs> shoes, my little bow tie, and he'd look at the mirror and say, 
Sister Robay said, Lord ain't but the one, and say, and who are you, sir? I would say, I'm John Henry Basie Jr., sir. Lord ain't but the one. So from the time I was four years old, I knew who I was. I wasn't nobody else. Right? Yes. So I could I could get along with anybody because I wasn't going to join everything that showed up. Yes, sir. Right. I could I have friends that are Muslims, but I'm not a Muslim. I can go I can go to the nation of Islam and tell Malcolm, like, I ain't joining. Malcolm said, Why don't you come and join us in the nation? I said, I ain't wearing no bow tie. I ain't <laughs> showing no newspapers. Yes, sir. And said, I'm gonna go to, to Peppers. And the soccer devil ain't getting me some big ear sandwiches, and drink me some gin, <laughs> and listen to some blues. And Malcolm laughed and said, You know, I was there once too. I said, Well, I'm still there. I ain't <laughs> looking. <yet." laughs> he said, well, Okay, you can work from the outside. No, no, if you know who you are, then you don't, you're not afraid of other people. Like, I'm not, I'm not a separatist. I'm not afraid of white people. Right. I'm a nationalist. That is That's to say, right. if we're the majority in a community, we should run that community. If it's a nation state, a neighborhood, or a city, the black people are the majority, they should have, if you believe in democracy, let, 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 let's, we should let's, have the power in that. Let's, let's, let's pause here for a moment, Prof. When we come back on the other side, let's pick up exactly there. As a nationalist, mm-hmm. as a Pan-Africanist who is not a separatist, such an important ideological distinction. We're going to pick up on the other side with you and your intellectual work and interests over the years coming in, coming, extending out of those Chicago years. But we're going to come back in, in just a second here at the Black Table with Professor John Grayson. Back in a minute. Here to the launch of the mass poor people's low wage assembly and moral march on Washington, D.C., June 18, 2022. We are a new, a set of and we are powerful. A set of force, and we are here. We're rising up to demonstrate the compelling power that we, poor and low income people, have to reconstruct society from the bottom up. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. Because we know that there is no scarcity in this land. The only scarcity is the moral will to do what's right. We are those with sub-minimum wage jobs who can't afford sky-high rent. People with disabilities are the fastest growing minority group. It's crazy to me that in 2021, it's still legal for workplaces to pay a sub-minimum wage to people with disabilities. There are still so much trial and tribulations that we go through as indigenous people. We can't get a decent wage to sustain ourselves, nor can we get adequate housing. Veterans across this nation say enough is enough. We can't pat essential workers on the back on one day and then cut their health care the next day. Health is a political choice. What more do I need to do to prove that my voice is just as valuable as anyone else's? There are still forces in denial that would try to slow walk our transition to a clean economy and a just future for us all. We have an immoral system run by moral people. But together we walk, and we walk and we fight. It's time for a change. Reconstruyamos esta gran nación. See, we are people of resilience as we fight these interlocking injustices together. When we work together, mobilize together, and rise together, we become a voice for the voiceless, and we become an agent of change in a time where great change is needed. We need the third reconstruction to ensure that deaf people, people with disabilities, and all people can have the right to live and to thrive. We know what they are doing, but the question is, what are we going to do? Reconstruction begins when we change our mentality and say it's time for you to get your foot off of my neck. Coming 
Welcome back to the Black Table. We are engaged in a riveting conversation with Professor John Bracey of the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, uh, one of the founding fathers of the field of Black Studies. Prof, when we left, uh, you were telling us about your commitment to social transformation, grounding in the Black community, but not exclusive to the Black community. You encountered two figures um, during your years at Roosevelt, um, August Meyer and Elliot Rudwick, white scholars who became very important in, in African-American intellectual history. Um, but you, you talk about the importance of mentorship. Um, they didn't treat you like a student, did they? Because in, in the space of a handful of years, you all published so many. How many books did you all publish together? Was it 13, 14? Like 12, 12, 14, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything from uh, Black Workers, uh, the yeah. book called The Rise of the Ghetto, uh, Conflict and Competition on Black Social Movement. You wrote about Black women, free Blacks. The book that we probably were, were introduced to more than any single book was, of course, you all's edited book on Black nationalism in America. Could you yeah. talk a little bit about, you know, because these are white scholars, and I know there was back and forth. Remember Mac Jones and them, like all these white guys coming in? But but you didn't run from that. You wrote about your blackness, but you did it with these two white authors. Talk a little bit about your relationship with Meyer and Rudwick, if you don't mind. Look, look my, my, view, my view is that black people are so important. I want the smartest white people to study them too, because mm. we're not gonna win if black people only study black people for black people. We are a minority population. We're a minority population. We need at best to neutralize white uh, you know, people, or to get allies who know your work and your people as well as you do. And so you want the smartest white people to study black people, right? Mm -hmm. And we won that one. If you name the top 10 white American historians, they write about black people. You know, Eric Bona or David Blight, right? You make a reputation as a white scholar, Eugene Genovese. You write about, you know, if you look at the top 10 white scholars, they write about black people. We won yeah, that yeah, because you, if memory serves me correctly, it wasn't it. Um, it was C. Van Woodward, Woodward, right? That you put in Malcolm's hand. I mean, you told him you need to read the strange career of Jim Crow or something. Like that. Yeah, no, no, it, it was it was Kenneth, it was Stamp, Kenneth Stamp. Oh, it was so Kenneth, Kenneth Stamp. Stamp. Yeah, yeah. Kenneth Stamp was a Trotskyist, right? I didn't know all these connections to so, Augie. See, Augie's a Shackmanite. People forget that Augie was the left, but he never told anybody. Wow. He's a Shackmanite, and he's the one that had me read Max Shackman, you know, Race and Revolution. My Nobody bad. reads this stuff at all, man. These <laughs> things are, and there's a network of Tom Kahn, Bayard Rustin, and Augie who are Shackmanites. Interesting. So Augie's a radical, making like he's a liberal because he's afraid of McCarthyism. But and then just just to just to bring it full circle with your own life, a woman you knew as a as a kid on the campus of Howard University, Dorothy Porter. Augie Meyer writes about the fact that she led him by the hand through the stacks in the Moreland collection to write his dissertation, which of course became yeah. Negro Thought in America. But yeah. you didn't know that at the time, I guess, when he was no, on no, the I didn't know. What got me about Augie is that he knew all these people that I knew. Like I used to do my homework in the Moreland Spring Garden because nobody was in there. Right. Nobody. When I'm in elementary school and I, I, my sister and I would come up from, from my elementary school, my mom's is teaching. She's director of student teaching. She taught Tony Morrison before she was Tony Morrison. She taught a Mary Baraka because you don't know that you're going to be famous. No question. Right? So you got to get a teaching certificate because you can get you a job teaching. Yes, sir. And my mom was director of student teaching, Roberta Flack. She integrated the music department at, at Alice Deal High School with Roberta Flack. Yes, sir. You can see Roberta Flack for a dollar out on Alabama Avenue in a trio before you ever heard of Roberta Flack. Cost you a dollar. So, 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 so while your mother is literally crafting these folks who now, of course, are globally legendary, you're in the Moreland room being babysat intellectually by the woman who ends up directing <laughs> Augie, Wilson, Augie Myers' dissertation before you met. You, you, you knew Dorothy Porter. She's in there watching you, basically. She knows. She took me. She did the same thing to me. I would sit there. And I say, Miss Porter, I got to do a paper on Tucson Lowershire. She said, come on in the back. She take you to the back and she pull out primary documents. And so I could write a paper for junior high school based on primary documents. 
My God. She said, don't read what they say about Tucson. This is what this is what black people say about Tucson. So this is what Haitians say about Tucson. So let me and she trust it. Yeah. And again, you know, given the town, I just want to make sure that uh so she does the same thing with Meyer, who then becomes one of the major figures in African American right. intellectual history, and then right. turns to you as an undergraduate at Roosevelt, along with Elliot Rudderick, and says, Come on, we're getting ready to uh to publish all these primary documents and, and do this intellectual history. How, how did how did that influence your own work? Because you've shaped so many careers. I think about even my generation, Stephanie Evans, uh, um, Kathy Adams, who of course is on our on mm -hmm. here often. How did that shape your your interaction with students? That that relationship. Well, they, with they treated me like an equal. I, I I have yet to understand why or how, but I was never patronized by people that were older than me. Hmm. They treated me as an equal. The only people that I was deathly afraid of intellectually was the Washington Park Forum. That's the one place I never spoke or decide. These are working class black people, radical black people. They knew more than about everything than anybody. And I would watch them eat up people that step into that circle. Otis would say, we have a young man here from the University of Chicago, and he's going to tell you something about slavery. And people would kind of chuckle and say, come on, bring it. You run your little mouth about what you learned at the University of Chicago. <laughs> These working class people that work in packing house yes, and, sir. and work in the steel mills ate you up. They ate you up. That's beautiful. They humiliated you. They ran you out of there in shame. And yes, Otis would say, and we have a young brother here from Rosemont. Do you have anything you want to say? I said, no, no. no. <laughs> I ain't doing that. Like, I know, I know, I know my, I know my elders. I know who no more. Like, I ain't, look, I can do that at all, look. Well, that's I ain't stupid in that circle. You know, well, well, Otis everything. Otis was a working class brother. Oh, Otis had. This, he this, read this. everything all the time. He would correct you. You say something, he said, that's what not, that, read the third volume of Capital. You're quoting the first volume. My God. See, see, Prof, I, I, I hope our viewers really understand the lesson you're teaching us now. Because I know for those of us who uh, apprentice, either apprentice with you, been deeply influenced with you and conversation with you, that your generation, I think about Anderson Thompson, I think about Michael Thelwell, I think about, um, you know, so many others, Ernest, Ernie Allen, a lot of people who end up at UMass, for example, with you. Yeah. That is y'all's attitude. You're no respecter of institutions. And I know we don't have a whole lot of time because, you know, we, we know you, you've edited volumes of the Revolutionary Action Movement papers with your friend Muhammad Ahmad and mm -hmm. so many others. We could talk about some of these formations, the NAACP papers work you've done. But I want to at least get us to the University of Massachusetts, where you've been for 50 years. I think this yeah. is the 50th year, right? And, um, you know, you all created the, the, the second PhD program in African American Studies in the country. But more importantly, you established a beachhead to bring the sensibility you're describing now into yeah. the academy. Could you it's talk a little bit about the Black Studies fight, the fight to establish Black Studies, and what you've been doing over these last decades now to keep that fight alive. And I know we all know it, it really is a fight. Could you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah. No, no, what we, what we did, we didn't come to UMass grateful to be there. We brought in people that were better than the white people that were there. Hmm. So you say, you want African writers, we got Chinua Achebe. I'm the one that got him to do that chance to lecture. Randolph Romney was a black chancellor and he said, get on this committee about lectures. I said, I don't want any, no, no, get on this committee. I get on the committee, they start nominating all these white people, blah, 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 blah. And I said, excuse me, have you heard of Chenoa Achebe? They say, who is that? What did he do? I said, well, I happen to have his beater right here. <laughs> yes, Why don't sir. you add him to the first year of people so it's not just old white guys, right? My That's God. when Chenoa ate him up with that thing on Conrad. He didn't tell us what he's writing. He didn't say a word. I said, how you doing with the Conrad piece? He said, yeah, you didn't tell us about Conrad. He said, the image, the thing was called the image of Africa. And yeah. Chino didn't say a word to nobody. He didn't have no, they, they added the subtitle after the thing came out. But Chino said, yeah, I'm writing about the image of Africa. And I said, well, that's mm -hmm. a broad topic. He said, yeah. And Chino ate him alive. We, we hooping and hollering. We in the auditorium full of people. And Chenoweth starts to read Conrad to these white people, and then he stops right 
Dan Coleman said, the man was a bloody racist. And we hollered. The white people sat there and said, like, oh, crap. <laughs> and they say, Conrad, I wrote three books on Conrad. They said, wow. Chino just blew him out of the water. Out of darkness. <laughs> what year was this, bro? This is 1974. 74. So it was by the first chance lectures. The first chance of lectures. But by, by then, you I mean, you all reach far beyond the academy. We used Sonia Sanchez and Archie Shep. And so, I mean, could you name some of the people y'all brought to? We brought, the, the year I came, they were, they were, look, we got there because of Herbert Alpecker. Herbert Alpecker okay. was supposed to come to the Du Bois papers. Harvard wouldn't take the papers because they said Alpecker was a communist. You know, and I think I said it's also because I'm Jewish, right? Then there wasn't no aptitudes on Harvard's campus. Right? My God! So the papers came down to UMass. And by the way, uh, those of you who haven't read Herbert Aptheker's biography, um, did you write the four? I'm trying to remember now. I had to go I had to look for it. No, I did, I did a, a preface to the American Negro Slavery Votes. Yes, to American Negro Slavery Votes. Yeah, right, yeah. so, I mean, you know what? Let's pause here, Prof, because we uh, are running right up against the clock. We got one more block. When we come back, oh, okay. I want you to pick up with there to talk about those early days at UMass. Okay. And then we'll, 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 we'll end with you kind of visiting some of the broad themes in your work and what you're working on now. Uh, when we come back right after this break at the Black Table with Professor John H. Grayson, Black Star Network, back in the world. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Table. I'm Greg Carr here at the Black Star Network with Professor John Bracey. Um, we're going to have to have a, a part two, Professor Bracey, because we've missed, we have missed a thing. You've packed this hour with so much. Um, when we left, you were talking about the early days of the UMass program and the folks you were bringing in. And in fact, you mentioned Herbert Aptheker. Of course, we know now the library at the University of Massachusetts is named for W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, could you talk about what you all have? Um, try to achieve, and in fact, have achieved with that program. I know, you know, of course, I went to Temple, which was the first PhD program in Africa State. Okay. And but when the UMass program came online, a lot of my uh, student fellow students finished their master's degrees and came to you for the PhD. I think okay. of Andrew Rosa and Kathy okay. Adams. Um, and we know that introductory fifty book course yeah, yeah. <laughs> is legendary. Talk a little bit about how y'all designed this program and what you were trying to accomplish there at UMass no, and the impact it's had on the field. What, what we saw is that people were coming to our program that didn't know our undergraduate major. So what we wanted to do in our major works was to replicate our undergraduate major in one year. Whew. So that, in effect, was the, the, the 30 hours of the undergraduate major in one year in a seminar. I went in 100 books. <laughs> See, because when Augie came to Roosevelt, he gave us, he passed out a, a sheet of paper that had 25 books on it. And we said, this is a bibliography? He said, no, 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 this is the reading list. I he said, said, he said 25, well, you said we lost that number. 25. He gave 25. you a sheet of paper, and you said, is this the bibliography? No, this is the reading list for the class. Yeah, yeah. No, so I know, I know you can do it. I said, start reading, and your work is, you know, full fellowship. Your work, it, 40 hours a day, 40 hours a week is to read and to study. Don't do nothing else. Read and study. Don't teach because you don't know anything. You can't teach you don't know anything. Read. You drop in jail. Get up, if, you, if you go to the library at 9 in the morning, take a break for class, go back to the library at 5, you will have all your work done and you have free time on the weekend. It's your job. It's your job. Right? So we wanted, we wanted the undergraduate major, we want that in your head in one year. Then we can get you to the graduate level, the specialized work. And, you and got to have the language of the discipline. You got I've to know you, the fundamentals. And, and I've heard you talk incessantly, regularly about the value of time. 
um, how this society would be very different if intellectual work, if there was time for intellectual work, people have to take the time to do that. Can, can you um can you talk about how important this kind of community of learners is, this concept, either in the university and you know, the black colleges, I'm afraid are following along the line of some of the worst tendencies of the white ones in terms of cutting out this notion of intellectual work. Could you talk a little bit about? No, it, the, the fact is we, we have a notion in, in intellectual is that somehow we're special and different from other people. Mm -hmm. right? My mm -hmm. experience, you know, even though I grew up on Howard's campus, I lived in Northwest DC in a black neighborhood, right? Yeah. Yes. I signed shoes at a, at a barbershop and cut hair at my cousin's barbershop, right? I could never be this wino. I never forget Dan, Daniel Napper. He was drunk all the time. He would always beat me at the crossword puzzles in the newspaper. And then he'd laugh at me and say, young blood, you go going to college, you better get to work because you your stuff ain't tight. This guy's drunk telling me this. Brains are not just in the academy. The, the, the crime in this world is that there, there are people that could solve cancer. Yes, sir. But they're out shopping cotton or they're working in a field somewhere or they don't have time to think. The most important thing you can give people is the time to think. We don't know how many geniuses, right, are sitting there in their spare time reading physics, but then they got to get back to the assembly line. My so God. they'll never get to a school. You know, you find them in community colleges. So if you want to see some really strong people, yes, sir. Most people that work, they got a full time job. Yes, sir. But they come in your class, they do the reading. They ain't playing. That's they right. Ain't playing. That's right. They said, no, 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 no. This is my step to get me the time to do the rest of my thinking. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, the smartest people are not necessarily the people in the academy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, was, I met I met people in the barber shops, the Washington Park Farm. I met oh. people in, in, in New York working in the kitchen with me. Of course. They could school me on a lot of things. Of course. And so don't don't think because you guys, you know, you grew up on a college campus that you know everything. So no, no, you know what you learn on a college campus. But, what can you learn about this? Well, you know well, this. Well, much of your writing and much of your work documenting uh, social movements has kind of been focused at those folks who are not at the university. I know you, you edited a whole volume, for example, co-edited with uh, with many others, a volume on Black women, African American women, and the vote. Could you talk a little bit about how this society, perhaps, the, some of the challenges we face in terms of gender and class, and even coalition building with other oppressed people and groups? Because a lot of your work has been devoted to that, workers and Black, Latino yeah, yeah, women, yeah. Black yeah. Jewish. And no, no, women. we're not the only people, we're not the only people on the Look, people have this notion that we discovered all these new things like transnationalism. Look, Booker T. Washington in his story of the Negro has two chapters to find two chapters on women. A new Negro for a new century to find chapters on black women. There's a book published by Reginald Major in the 1890s called Noted Black Women. Nobody discovered gender last week. Black people, when they had brains in their head, knew that the women were as smart as men and in most cases smarter. Yes, sir. It well, this not, is, uh, it did not come out of white feminism. Black people were there a long, long, long time ago. White feminists were trying to get where black women had already been. They say, we want to come out of the house and go into the workplace. We already been there. My mom started school when she's 13 years old. She don't need to be pointed to the workplace. She's trying to figure out how you get out of the work. That's what black women want. Black, you know, a black man is proud of his wife doesn't have to work. Not because she works anyway, because she don't trust him with the money. And she knows <laughs> that. That okay, if we get together, then you have a family. But we're not gonna rely on your one job because you know how white people are about black men, and you yeah. might be unemployed any day, any minute, any time, because somebody call your name and you swing on them. Right? So I'm gonna keep my job. That's a that's a key that's black a key women, point. Black women don't sit in the house doing nothing. No, them, them, black women have always worked. That's exactly that since black it's been women, you know, you know those those that's mothers right. and wives of, of millionaire basketball players, they yes. they do work. They'll no say problem. we have a committee that helps younger black athletes stay out of trouble. They don't have to do nothing. You know, right. if you right. LeBron James's wife. He make thirty million dollars a year. You ain't got to worry about money. You say, okay, what you doing? What you doing in the community? What you gonna do with all that money? Gonna work. 
gonna work. Yeah, work they, to, to transform the community. That's right. That's right. And, and I'm, it's lifting as we climb. The point is, like I'm moving up, and, but I and, got my hand down, and I'm taking you with me. You can call it respectability or whatever you want. If you were lying in the gutter. Yes, I'm going to stop in the chat or pick you up out of the gutter. Like, I'm not going to get down there with you or say that's your way of life. That is not your way of life. Now, I'm going to stand you up. Now, if you decide to go back and lay down again, that's on you. That's but on if you. I see you lying in the gutter, I'm not going to say that's the way black people are. No, no, no. That's what white people did to you. And, and I'm going to give you the chance to do better. I'm, I'm going to stand you up. I'm glad you yes. raised that, Bible because you not only in your work with the National Association of Color Women's Clubs, you've documented that, the, all that stuff is there. You, you've you've reached a stage now in your life and work. You've been chair of that department twice. I don't know how they pulled you back to do it again, but that's a story for the MMS part two. But a, as you look forward, I know you've been working on memoirs. Uh, you've got some work, you, you, multi-volume work that you had committed to do with Ernie Allen on some other mm -hmm. things. What do you see in terms of some of your projects you're working on now? Because you know, we know you know you can't spell retire, so. We, we uh, like, like I tell the young people, the goal in life was not to go out into the cornfields of Western Mass and do anything. This is, this is a secondary, this is a retreat with the Nixon years. They're pushing us back, you know, uh, they're murdering people all over the country, Black Panthers and a whole bunch of other people, right? And so we got to have a place we can hold on until the movement comes back again. Save who you can. Mm. You know, take Bill Strickland out of Atlanta, Institute for the Black Will. You know, uh, get Chester Davis so he can do the school thing. You yes. know, get Ernie Allen out of the League of Revolutionary Black Will. We're trying to hold on, you know, getting Mike on a snick. We're going to hold on till we can go back out into the street again and continue our work. Well, it took... I tell students, I say, I thought this would be like five years, and y'all would five again, and we could go back out in the street. Yes. It took all 50 years, but now y'all here. Yes, sir. That's what the work is. The work is, is not me talking about some book nobody's going to read, even though it yes. might be important to you and your cousin and the people in your, your group at whatever school you're at. Yes, sir. You want to you take that same ability of thought back into the community because we are still on the bottom. Yes, sir. Right. You, you know how many, you know, like Malcolm said, what do you call a Negro with a Ph.D.? And he said, what, the guy say a nigger. Wow. Right? Don't get confused. Don't get confused. They will, white people will shoot you just as dead if you adopt a so-and-so than if you're a delivery boy. And they have proved that. Barack Obama had all the bona fides you could possibly have. That's right. All the bona fides. She's educated on top of educated. Yes, sir. Right. Ain't mad about slavery because he didn't come through that way. He come from the empire, not from, right. not from the middle passage. So he so, ain't mad. You know that he ain't mad. He ain't mad like we mad. No. See, we're not going to get no black person from Georgia because they mad. Right. And they know why they mad, and they coming for us. That's why white people <laughs> keep them guns. They said, no, no, we stole it, and they wanted it back. And the way we treated them, like the boy said, damnation to women, I will, and he wrote this in 1922. In dark water. He said, I will forgive white men all kinds of things. I will forgive slavery. I will forgive exploitation, but I will never forgive the treatment of black women. I will never forgive that. That is a, uh, that's profound. He said that in 1922. Prof, it, it reminds me of something Michael Gomez wrote in his book, Exchanging Our Country Marks. He says that right. in his in his mind, to his mind, it was the assault on black women, sexual assault, right. physical assault, that literally became the, the rallying point that created this notion of blackness in enslavement. It was the assault on women, because it was really that's literally an assault on the future. We know, I mean, we we don't have a future <laughs> if you literally so um, but but let's pause here for a second, and I say pause because we want you to come back. Uh, Professor Bracey, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll schedule some time for you to come back because we've only scratched the surface. Um, we want to thank you for, for coming and spending uh, this hour with us. And we are glad to see you hail and hearty and still swimming with both fists. And particularly for young people out there, every, all the social movements, please pay very careful attention to the words we've heard from Professor John Bracey today because they provide a roadmap. They roadmap for us. Um, thank you, Professor Bracey. Um, and in a moment, when we return, I'm going to uh, clear the table and we'll get ready for next week. Back in a moment on Black Star Network with The Black Table.
Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to The Black Table. I'm Greg Carr here on the Black Star Network. We've been joined for the last hour by Professor John H. Bracey, Jr., a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, founding father of the field of Black Studies, and one of the most important intellectuals of the 20th and early 21st centuries. Also an institution builder, non-parallel. And as we heard Professor Bracey discuss today, the importance of intellectual work it can't really be overstated, but the, the importance of that work is also um, very important in direct relation to how it transforms the community and creates a better society. We heard him talk about the fact that when we think about universities, when we think about formal education, when we think about the people who go there, who work there, who teach there somehow perhaps being better than those who aren't, that's simply not true. We know as the ancient Egyptians would say, that good speech, that deep thought, that the ability to think through problem solving is to be found among the masses of the people. And those who are the best at their job, like Professor John Bracey, know that and have practiced that and continue to show us how to practice it. So join us next week for our next installment of The Black Table. And until then, everyone stay safe and we'll see you next week. Thank you.